some members joining on Zoom. So I will go ahead and call this meeting to order of our Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee on September 15th, if we can get a roll call first. Arenas? Jones? Present. Here. Mayhan. Sorry about that. Thank you. Mahan? Jimenez? And Perales. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And as we begin, uh, I want to remind our Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at the meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the uh, chair or council members, uh, commissioners or staff. All members of the public uh, safety finance and strategic support committee uh, and staff in the public are expected to refrain from abusive language, repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in removal from the meeting. Okay. And uh, we have nothing under our work plan, so we will skip down to, or no changes to work plan, so we skip down to the, the consent calendar, which actually we don't have anything on the consent calendar. So we'll go down to uh, item D1, our first committee report. And that's our police department operations and performance by monthly status report. Welcome, Lieutenant Donahue. Thank you, sir. I'll wait for the uh, presentation to get set. All right. So thank you and good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Steve Donahue. I'm the commander of the research and development unit at the San Jose Police Department. And today I will be presenting the department's operations performance by monthly status report. Today, we'll be covering citywide crime statistics. Then I'll be presenting on other matters of interest, including the gender-based violence response and strategy work plan update, and a brief update on redistricting efforts. We'll begin with our citywide part one UCR crime statistics for the first seven months of this year. As you can see, UCR defined rapes are up 31% when comparing this year and the five-year average. You may rem remember this number was 43% in my last bi-monthly update. So as a reminder, changes to small number sets result in large percentage differences. And as we move through the year, this comparison ratio should continue to reduce. The other number I'd like to point out to you is this 29% increase in larceny, as you can see by the red box. We're dealing with a pretty large number here, so we took a deeper dive into that one. Now, what you're looking at is all the crimes that make up our larceny numbers and how we compare them in the changes from 21 or 20 to 21 and 21 to 22. Specifically, take a look at those rows next to the red arrows. You'll see that vehicle burglaries over $950 dropped 23% from 2020 to 2021. And this was likely due to everyone being at home from COVID shelter in place. Then we see it jump after the shelter in place was lifted with a 68% increase comparing 21 to 22. And the same pattern repeated in shoplifting with a 33% drop, then a 105% increase and a 57% drop with 133% increase. So based on these patterns, we believe that the larceny numbers increased because we're comparing them to a year with a deficit in those numbers. Next, I'll be discussing our gender-based violence response and strategy work plan update. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we still see an increase in UCR-defined rapes. As we move further into the year, the span of this increase is diminishing. This is due to the characteristics of comparing larger numbers and smaller numbers. However, that nearly 38% increase is still a cause for concern. So we took a deeper dive into those numbers. And our big question here was why? Why are UCR rapes going up? Is it still attributable to the intersectionality tool I've mentioned before? Is it to COVID? Well, we found two significant factors. The first is shown in that top chart. We have a nearly 160% increase in reporting historical rapes that are over one year old. And this means they occurred prior to 2021. So in 2020 or earlier. And we think we're seeing them reported now because there are more interactions with survivors, more opportunities to interact and report. 
The second big factor that we're seeing, a lot more incidents being reported to us that did not occur in San Jose, and we're transferring them to other agencies. This is the bottom chart. A lot of these are coming from the intersectionality tool and us asking about historical rapes. You may remember that we asked survivors if they've ever been sexually assaulted. And if it wasn't reported before, we're taking the report and we investigate it. Then when that investigation leads us to find out the rape occurred elsewhere, we're giving it to that agency for their investigation. So this transfer occurred in 29 cases so far this year. <clears throat> These charts show the current status of both the city and countywide work items since the inception of the gender-based violence response and strategy work plan. There was a little movement on these charts that I'm gonna talk about in the next couple slides. So this table shows you the San Jose specific work items. You'll see two changes on this slide marked by those red arrows. And first, we completed the department-wide training recognizing trauma in children. And the second, we are up to 92% complete in the trauma-informed care training. And this was only 85% at my last report in June. And I know it's not marked with an arrow, but uh, take a look at that fourth yellow line about the vigilant parent training. Um, our very own crime and intelligence analyst, Angeli Donzanti, formerly Angeli Montessa, was on the Dr. Phil show talking about our successes with vigilant parent and the show was recorded in August, but um, should be aired sometime around November. So look for it coming to a TV near you. I would also like to take a moment to plug the upcoming screening of a film developed in collaboration with our Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force regarding sextortion, the hidden pandemic. This film's an investigation into the world of online grooming and sextortion, which is a reality for one in seven children online. The film and a panel discussion following it will be held at the Calvary Chapel on Hillsdale Avenue on this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. Everyone is invited, but seats are limited, and people can register online through the QR code that's on the screen right now, or by typing sextortionfilm.com into your browser window. This table shows the countywide work items. I'd like to point out that we are now able to mark the three items with red arrows as completed, leaving only one countywide work item still in progress. This graphic shows the status on the Sexual Assault Bill of Rights. And as you can see, we are still waiting on the printing of the resource cards. We checked with the county again last week and they are still in process. And now we will move on to redistricting. The redistricting RFP was posted on Bidingo a few months ago. The submission deadline was extended a couple of weeks in the hopes of getting additional proposals, and we received two proposals. The evaluation committee scored both of them. In early August, the evaluation committee eliminated one of those proposals, and the committee met to discuss the remaining one, and they are going to schedule a follow-up interview with the remaining proposer in the next three to four weeks to discuss the process and gather additional information. A decision to move forward or not will be made after this follow-up interview. And if the remaining proposal is rejected by the committee, the RFP would be reposted for submission. And now we are here for any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much. And we will go to members of the public first on this item. Uh, as a reminder, this is on item D1, the Police Department Operations and performance by monthly status report. And I'll first ask, do we have any members that have submitted cards in person? No. Nope. Don't believe we do. First speaker is Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto for the uh, for the work that you're doing with regard to the um, with regard to policing. Uh, the sex crimes, the domestic violence, the larceny, and the rapes. My question is, though, is that how many convictions do you have? Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Thanks a lot for today's agenda. I think it's a really interesting agenda for yourselves at this Um 
the presenter uh, did a very nice job. Thank you. That you know, I think it's called UTC statistics. I don't know if that's quite the word, but over the past five years, trying to give context to that, that they have rise, risen in, in some ways, but that isn't indicative of overall crime rising at this time. And thank you for offering that. That gives us choices how to consider uh, our future of crime issues in San Jose. I feel that uh, because of the AOPR uh, flood <laughs> from last November, uh, there's a lot of uh, policing going on right now. And I think it's having an effect. Um, you're talking about that. Good luck how to now begin to talk about uh, its data collection practices and its accountability and uh, what we what are our rights as everyday community with, with such technology. I also wanted to offer that uh, in San Diego, where I'm kind of transitioning to right now, we have got a possible fentanyl uh, OD situation going on. People are cutting their fentanyl really strong and people are dying in the downtown area. This was the same thing that was going on in San Jose at this time last year. And I thought I would mention it to yourselves now as ways to ask uh, how you can offer help to this situation. And very much of a thank you that uh, Councilperson uh, Perales is going to be headed to San Diego soon uh, in early October. Uh, and also to Tijuana, who's going to those two places where I, I hope he can give some good examples of how we practice uh, community and, and gang issues that uh, can maybe have help, be of help to, to Tijuana issues. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. And um, I see Mr. Soto put his hand back up. Um, and I believe you had about a minute 30 left. You might have accidentally muted yourself. Go ahead, Mr. Soto. I absolutely did not mute myself, but that's cool. It's expected. So there wasn't no, uh, there, there's no convictions on here. There's only arrests. The, so my question is, where are the convictions? Like how many of these arrests result in conviction? And number two is that the, uh, the items that were delineated on the presentation, they are targeted towards Prop 47. Now Prop 47 was passed by the voters. Okay, so if you have an issue with those types of crimes, you need to take it through the democratic process and bring it up to the voters. When you use it as hype, as, as, as hype on the local level, the only thing that you do is you get the middle class and the upper classes in an uproar, okay, because they will back everything that you're doing. It's fear mongering, okay, because CDC was filled. Those beds were filled with men that were convicted of these types of crimes and they were in prison. And that's what led to the prison population being increased so much so that it had become cruel and unusual punishment to put a human being in there. Okay, so now you wanna revert back to that? You wanna revert back to policies that created the cruel and unusual punishment environment that compelled Anthony Kennedy, the Supreme Court Justice of the United States to say, you know what, you just gotta start releasing them. That's why Prop 47 came in. Back to the committee. Thank you very much. Um, I'll see if there's any committee members that have their hands up. It's uh, Councilmember Ennis. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the, the report. I will be staying off of video because earlier I got kicked out a couple of times, so I apologize to our public. Um, I wanted to go to page, um, I think it's page nine of the, um, of the presentation where it has the UCR defined rape offenses and the five-year historical look. I know that there is an increase um, uh, and, and probably because we are asking this question, um, which I think is, is a great tool to have incorporated, um, and, and it sounds like there's also, um, one year plus, um, reports, right, for 2022. Um, 
but there's still there's still a significant number of uh, in terms of a jump, I would say, um, from the five years back. If we look at zero days from 2015 to 2022, that's more than a uh, tri, you know, triple of that number. Um, and so, it, you know, if we compare, I guess, apples to apples, um, the, the one year plus does look like it's increasing um, over the last five years. And I can, I can understand that maybe we have had um, some outside or outside our city or the other municipalities, it's not always so clean. So there, that's uh, 29 cases, right? And so that kind of drops it a little bit back down to what we normally would see. Um, but I don't know if we've ever factored that um, before in terms of seeing um, added jurisdiction um, rapes. Is that something new that, that you've seen? Um, because there was a, a, a kind of a bit of a double of a jump. What, what do you think that is attributable to? Thank you for your question, council member. So actually, I'm glad you brought up this slide. If, if you look at the row for UCR defined rapes, just the rape row on there, and you see it starts with 173 in 2018, mm -hmm. and it jumps, it goes up roughly 60 to 2019. Mm -hmm. okay? And it comes down roughly 60 in 2020, mm -hmm. back up 30 or 25. And so when you see these jumps, what, what I'm looking for is a historical jump that's outside the normal limits. But as you can see, it's going up and down within 60 incidents every year. So that tells me right now we're still within that normal limit of up and down. If I were to see 80 or, you know, like a minus 80 or a plus 80, that's outside that normal limit. But because back in 2018, 2019 and 2020, those were all 60 point jumps, right? So that, that's kind of what I'm looking at to see if it's in normal limits for the up and down right now in rape. And right now we're, we are seeing a, a within normal limit. That doesn't mean it'll end up that way at the end of the year, but right now only having gone through July, we're okay. The other thing- Wait, uh, hold on, let me stop you right there. So you said you would be concerned if it reached what limit? Did you say 40% or did you say 60? No, no, I'm not talking about percentage points. I'm talking about the number, just the oh, number. the number. Yeah, oh. so look at 2018. Rape in 2018 was 173 rapes during right. the same period, right? Mm -hmm. But then it, in 2019, it bumped up 60 rapes to mm -hmm. 236. But then the following year, it went down 60 rapes back to 174, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that 60 points is going up and down, right? And so when we go from... 198 in 2021, up 60 points to 269, we're still within that 60 point bump, all right? So that's what I'm looking at to say, okay, what's happening right now is the rapes fluctuate every year. And there, there's we're not gonna have a steady number across the board, but are our fluctuations outside normal limits? Mm -hmm. And what this is showing me is over the last five years, we're within a 60 point jump up or down every year, right? So that's where I'm saying, okay, we're gonna hold off for a little bit in passing judgment whether or not this is in or out, or I'm sorry, whether or not this is outside that normal limit because we have that 60 point jump. Does that make sense? Well, I think it, it makes sense in the way that you're explaining. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and because I'll tell you, you, you there is, there's more than a 60 jump. That difference between 2018 and 2022, that's 96. And then uh, the, the, the following year, the 236, uh, of course, that's uh, even greater. The 174 in 2020, that's 95, right? Yes, so um, I'm comparing year to year, not across the entire five-year span. Yeah, um, but if every year you have an, a slight increase, where do you say the threshold is high enough? Because it'll always have an increase. Um, so, so to me, I, I don't know what we're 
um, judging as a as a threshold, except for the year prior. It's not as bad as the year prior, but but here we are seeing it is worse than the year prior. It's and for and I would say 2020 and 2021 are kind of misnomers. I would expect actually to see this even lower, but we know that violence against women goes uh, increases during pandemics and so we should have been prepared for it and that number should have been a lot lower than what it is right now and i suspect that it is much higher than of course this is an underreported crime so I, i'm actually very uncomfortable saying that we're okay with this um and i we see this as normal unless there's a greater jump than 60 I think for every year that we look back, because we're always looking back, we're never looking proactively to the future, which is something that we, we really need to shift, is what are we doing to change those strategies? Now, you know, the, 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 there's some, there's some uh, statistics up top about burglaries to vehicles and petty theft and shoplifting. And I bet you maybe some of this burglary vehicle that's on, on page uh, six for some of those folks who are viewing um, at home, maybe that has to do with uh, catalytic converters. Maybe it has to do with just regular old uh, break-ins or uh, whatever it, it is, um, because there, maybe there's more vehicles out there that need fobs. And so they're not stealing the car, they're just stealing the stuff inside the car that's probably more valuable to them or they can sell uh, quite easily. But there's a rhyme or reason to some of these crimes. And we don't seem to be asking ourselves those questions around sexual assault. The rhyme or reason, first of all, uh, to make sense of these numbers. And, and two, what are we doing differently? Now we're asking the question. We're asking these questions. We're increasing our numbers because of those questions. But what is our strategy? What is it that we are going to do differently as a result? I'd like to link these numbers to a response, and I'm not seeing that. Thank you. Um, no, no, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not finished. I'd like to have a response, Chair. That was, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if you were done with the question, and then that way we could not see. Not done. Could... Lieutenant, I'm did you sorry, want to respond? I, I, I didn't understand the question, ma'am. Could you repeat? The question is, that there are responses and strategies that we use in other crimes, looking back. Uh, we, we had a response to like the ca catalytic converters getting stolen from cars, right? There's a response to that. There's, there, there's even um, some kind of um, uh, whatever kind of a, adhesion tool that you can use so that those catalytic converter um, it can't be stolen um, as easily as before. And here I'm looking at an increase in statistics. I, I, I want to know what your, not your comfort level, um, and maybe not my comfort level, but a, a data, uh, an evidence-based uh, statistic threshold that would say to us, this is typical. Let's not have any, let's not, you know, this is not going to raise eyebrows because this is just an increase in maybe population, an increase in rape, an increase in sexual assaults, but there is no other explanation aside from your comfort level in terms of increases over the years. So I want to know, one, how are we determining this data aside from the 60 off and on, although I don't, it, off and on from year to year, um, what, what data are we using to determine whether this is normal? Um, and I would say we don't use normal. Um, and, and second, what are we doing in response? Okay, thank you for your question, council member. Um, here's what I can tell you. I'm going to move the slide to our sexual assault strategy and work items. These are all items. These are tangible things that our department has done 
just in, city, in the city of San Jose to positively affect sexual assault in our community. On top of this, we have the report that was presented to the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee in March of this year, and that lists a tremendous number of items, including policy changes, changes to our, um, our intersectionality tool, changes to the cross-section between human trafficking, sexual assault, and in partner violence. We've dramatically increased YWCA referrals and advocacy participation in investigations. We've created work groups that meet every month about sexual assault and intimate partner violence. Um, I, council member, I would argue that our department is doing quite a bit to positively affect sexual assault in our community. And I, I have to be honest, I'm proud of what we're doing. I think the, the commanders in these units and the people that are put into place are able to think outside the box and find strategies and means by which to affect something that is so incredibly heinous in our community. And um, they report out statistics every year showing that year in and year out as sexual assaults increase in the community in frequency, it's because we're able to bond and communicate and connect with survivors in ways that have never happened before. The intersectionality tool was a huge leap forward for our agency. And so um, I would say that, you know, there, there are a lot of stats that, I mean, we can bring back the, the report that was in March, but I'll, I'll tell you, just seeing the bi-monthly stats about UCR defined rapes don't explicitly define everything our agency is doing to protect survivors and work with our community to affect this problem. Thank you for your response. This this work plan is actually something that I requested. And it's something that was done because we had joint meetings with the county. So I know what this work plan um, entails. I know what it holds because I've asked for it based on the feedback that I get from these joint meetings. So I know what this has on this. Um, and I'm asking, and, and, and I'm also very proud of the work that has been done but I'm also asking for proactive strategies to address some the increase in rapes and not the rapes that we have seen that are one year plus, but the rapes that we're seeing um, zero days under the zero days. So for me, I you know, there's still an eyebrow to be raised about uh, this number. And my questions would be where, where, who, who are these survivors? Is, are these um, intimate partner violence? Is this, is this uh, college uh, related incidents? Is, you know, there's a level of, of analysis that I'd like for us to use when we're looking at this data, because not everything that we have in terms of data is corresponds to some of these work items. These work items, um, are an effort to improve the way that we interact with our survivors and then the way and to increase the capacity for our officers as they're faced with some of these tragic um, incidents uh, to be able to interface um, with survivors. So there's absolutely a pride in the work that we're doing and um, but please make no mistake, I will always ask for more because I think our survivors deserve that. Um, and that this is the question that I'm asking is is for us to establish something that is data driven that says to us this, you know, this falls within um, a normal range or within a range um, that uh, can fall between years in terms of a, a slight increase. So that's what I'm asking for. You can come back we, uh, 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 during another meeting or we can take this offline and we can um, figure out a question, uh, what that threshold is. Um, it just will change with the person who's uh, reporting it back to us. And uh, fortunately you've, you've been very consistent with us and you've been the one reporting back to us, but I'd like to know uh, a measure 
that is uh, bound by statistics, that's bound by within ranges that that you know don't create an an arching of the uh, of the eyebrow um, for us. Um, otherwise, I, I am going to I'm going to question the numbers. I'm going to see um, that. Uh, 86 as an increase uh, to survivors and that there's something going on in our community that need that we need to address. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to move forward from there. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask that you follow up with me um, offline around this. And, um, and then I'm going to move on with uh, the other, the item that's in the work plan that talks about the developmental field experts or the behavioral health specialists that um, uh, that was provided or the training that was provided. Um, who 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 are those experts that provided the, the video and was was it, um, it how, how are we how are we providing those videos? Is it during um, when when you all check in, I, I can't remember what that's called, but when you're all doing your check in, what when are the videos provided? And and who who provided, who are those specialists? Are you talking about the recognizing trauma in children video? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that recognizing trauma in children video um, was put on by our Bureau of Investigations. Um, it was opened, I believe, by Deputy Chief Washburn, and then the presenter was our Child Advocacy Center forensic interviewer, and she presented. I want to say it was about fifteen minutes of. Um, re how to recognize trauma in children. It may have been a little bit longer. My memory is a little bad on the time, but um, we presented you with a copy of that video in the spring of this year. Um, so that, yeah, it was played at briefings for the department personnel and BFO and the department members received an order to watch it if they hadn't seen it in briefings to watch it on their own by May 30th. Uh, okay, and is there any like follow up in terms of questions that people have to answer to prove that they watched the video? Is it just an honor system? Uh, yeah, no, ma'am. It's it's the honor system. When you're ordered to watch a video, you watch a video. That's we order our department members to watch videos and receive training all the time, and and uh, we got great feedback from this video. As a matter of fact, um, it was actually pretty powerful. Oh, is that right? Okay. So what, what was the feedback um, um, that you received? Well, from what I understand, the, the, a lot of people appreciated the way that the forensic interviewer broke down the fact that recognizing trauma in children could be a lot of different things, not just a matter of them responding in one way, but the myriad of emotions and, and psychological and emotional responses that children could have. So um, it sounded like it was pretty eye-opening to people. Got it. Okay. Well, that, that is really wonderful to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy uh, to hear about that. And I don't know how we, um, we measure this, because uh, I think all of the really great work that's being done in, on this work plan needs to somehow um, reflect in the way that we um, measure. I, we have to measure it somehow. And I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I would love to see some level of, of measure in terms of how our officers are more proficient in recognizing trauma or more um, proficient in the way they interact with children. Um, because, you know, not everybody has a child in their life and, um, and you just, you know, you, you're all dealing with, with uh, kind of the worst days and worst cases um, for families. And so uh, I know that leaves, um, also trauma on the side of the officer and I, I think it's important for us to continue to talk about um, these issues and so that it could be table you know tabletop conversation that it could be something that we all recognize and that we're very um, we're all proficient in doing so do you have any ideas on on how to maybe capture that information that change maybe a shift in in our officers I actually think that would be a great topic of conversation for when we meet with you about the uh, the other types of measurement that you've been talking about during this meeting. I think it'd be great to take that offline and kind of explore ideas just personally. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Well, listen, I uh, thank you so much. I, I know I asked some some tough questions. I always tend to. Um, it's, I feel it's my responsibility to do that as part of uh, our PISFIS committee. Um, it, it doesn't also uh, mean that I'm not grateful and absolutely just um, fond of and, and, and really love our, I love our police department. I love what everyone is doing uh, to make sure that our survivors and um, are supported in the best way that possible and that we also prevent some of these uh, crimes when um, when we're able to and that's part of that vigil vigilant uh, parent uh, training uh, that I'm really glad to hear um, Anjali was was able to do that with Dr. Phil. Um, I think we should be recognized for all the really really wonderful work uh, that you're all doing. Um, so I, I do want to end with just a deep, deep level of appreciation of, of where we've uh, come uh, this last couple of years and, and just a, a, a thank you. So those are my those are my comments. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Thank you. We have a motion. Second. Second. I don't see any other hands up. Okay, we'll come back. Um, I got a couple of questions, comments. Um, and just to pick up where Councilman Dennis left off, um, as a note, reserve officers also have to watch these videos. So I watched it and um, and it's online. Actually, I was just kind of searching to see. It's actually open to the public. So if anybody wanted to watch it, it's on San Jose Police Department's uh, YouTube page. So um, it's available and accessible. It actually is. 16 minutes 20 seconds lieutenant so you were you're almost spot on close so, um but um yeah so it's it, but anyway, I, I wasn't aware actually personally that it was it was available there um for for everybody but anybody can take a peek at that so it's actually um helpful for for others that may be interested um in that video and, and appreciate councilman redennis's advocacy to continue to, to um, push on helping to educate our officers and and help them to be better trauma informed especially on issues like this um coming back to the presentation if we could look at um slide six it's labeled um i i was just looking at some of the 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 statistic there and i appreciate that some of the smaller numbers as as you've noted um, right, we'll, we'll show a larger uh, change in percentage, right, but with um, a smaller uh, base number. But even still, for instance, the, the uh, grand theft shoplifting, uh, 73 could be, you know, looked at as a smaller number when you look at some of the other ones and, you know, above 1,000. But at the same time, I, I think that's a big enough base number to, to go off of and you see a pretty big jump in that one as well. I just I know, noticed you didn't highlight that one, pull that out, but I, I think that's a pretty big jump. And the reason I mentioned that and then the others that you did pull out is, you know, anecdotally, this is what I think, you know, I've been hearing and I know I've heard from some of my colleagues that we hear out in the community that there's a, a sense of, hey, yeah, we feel that there's been a jump in, in these crimes. And it, it could be, you know, that the because of you know, what we were referencing it to, which is the past two years, which is COVID, and you highlighted that. But even if we were to take away those two years, so the, at least the 2020-21, the, the drop, say, for instance, 33%, 57%, the, the growth is significant enough, I think, that we would still be seeing a, a fairly you know, decent percentage of, of growth in those same areas. So I, I think the reality is um, that what people are perceiving is true, and there, there is a, an increase even above and beyond the, the decreases that we saw during the pandemic. Um, and I, I would actually agree with uh, our caller, Mr. Soto, that uh, some of this, and we're hearing the conversation happening now, actually, with an opportunity at the state level on, you know, is there is there a shift to try and, and address some of this, you know, shoplifting and theft and, and uh, that we've been, been seeing the larceny? And, and so um, I appreciate that, and I think that We'd likely get some agreement from our police department, right? That uh, that we we need to take a look at this because it's not just a trend here in the city of San Jose. This is across the the state, where um, 
people have, have I think, felt there is a, a greater opportunity and less consequences when you're um, committing particular crimes, especially some of these, like, um, you know, some of the, the, the crimes that now are under the $950 threshold. So um, I just appreciate seeing that, that, that data, and I think it does speak to what some of our community members have seen. Um, going into the, the UCR info, I, I too was going to, I think, speak to the, the work plan that, that you have been sharing with us and that the progress that you have had. So, so thank you, Lieutenant, for I think just highlighting that being, I think that at the moment, the best response coming out of our police department and how we can try to address a, a very complicated uh, and, and, and frustrating issue, the increase that we've seen over the years in sexual assault crimes, especially given that they, these are very difficult crimes from a police officer standpoint to prevent, um, right? Other street level crimes that, you know, just merely a presence of a police officer in the area, we know we can, you know, we can correlate a, a, a decrease in that crime. Um, we can't say the same when it comes to sexual assault. The presence of a police officer, that's, uh, you know, near impossible in most situations where these sexual assaults are occurring. Thus, we have to be thinking creatively and with other partners if we're going to really reduce these types of crimes. And if we're, I, I would say, the increase that we've seen, I, I do think it's attributed to both what you've stated, which is the, the way we've collected the UCR data, but also just an increase on you know, people reporting um, and, and unfortunately, potentially an increase on people just committing those crimes. And I know that that's uh, of, of utmost concern to Council Member Arenas is kind of trying to drill down um, you know, where, where that may actually be happening, where is the best place for us to be allocating our time and resources. Uh, and at the end of the day, I do think that our work plan that we have is very comprehensive and we should be sticking to that and completing those areas that are in process or pending. Additionally, I think that we need to be looking at where can we better partner with organizations that are not the police department so then that way we can be getting involved in areas where we're seeing uh, maybe some of the, the, the higher rates of sexual assault. For instance, and, and I don't know if we have this data, I, I believe we could, um, Right, if they're ha they are happening more, say, with college students, right, or or being reported from high school students, or kind of what areas are we seeing? We we can gather that data, right, based on the reports that we're taking. As far as I know, we've seen obviously the age groups and that breakdown. But can we get even more detailed as far as we can p pull out and go, wow, yeah, we've we are we are seeing a trend or a, a sharp increase with college age, you know, students or college, uh, you know, uh, actual students that are in college, something like that. Is that is that data that we have or can pull out? Actually, if you give me just a second, they may have already had that for you in March. I did see a good breakdown of the, the demographics in the March presentation. But yes, we can absolutely break down the survivors by age group. And if we do that, that'll give you an idea of whether or not they were, you know, there's going to be a little gray area around 18 years old and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, we can break them down by age group. Yeah, I've seen that one, that one regularly in it. I, I, I'm not recalling either how uh, specific it got. I, I do believe you denoted um, some of the locations in the, the, the March report, if I'm recalling as well, or the, or the spring report. But, um, but I, my point is, if we can, then we should be looking at that to see where then could we be most proactive to try and, and and help make a difference, and maybe there maybe there's not a, a specific area or trend to focus, but if there were, for instance, uh, a, a a glaring increase in college age students, but if we could even drill down further and find out, actually, it was students attending college, not just college age, but actual you know students in college, we're, we're recognizing there may be an increase there, um, then potentially we could focus our partnerships and outreach and engagement, right, that proactive work that again may not be the San Jose Police Department doing that. It could be you know, partnering with some of the universities to, to, to do that work, but we can help share that info with them because they may not also know it as granular as we do and, and have access to this level of, of data. And we could help to, to flag that in, um, you know, in certain areas. And so, so uh, go ahead. I can tell you right now, um, 
on page, looks like page six of that report, table 4A has a heat map over the last five years from January 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2021 of the ages at the time of report for all survivors of sexual assault in San Jose. And what that table shows, um, just I'm just going off the colors because it's a heat map, um, is you've got um, the most pop, or not pop, <laughs> terrible choice of words, the most common uh, times are gonna be from 13 to 17. And then um, it looks like 18 to 22. So yeah, you're talking about high school age are the most common report times. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, that's just the age of the survivor at the time of report. We don't have the ability to determine the age of survivor at the time of incident, right? So that could be reports from any time prior to that. Mm -hmm. We don't have that ability, you're saying? Yeah, we can't. We, the only way to do that is to read each report to log the time that the incident or incidents occurred. Mm -hmm. And that's not part of the data um, mm -hmm. Mining that we have available in our Versidex system. Okay, I do see where that would be helpful. I imagine you do as well, right? Kind of being able to drill down even further to realize where um, the crime is actually, or when the crime is actually being committed, right? So then that way we know is it being reported, say, by high school students because they've finally found a voice, right, or or somebody to listen to, or that they felt comfortable with, but it actually is something that happened when they were uh, much younger. Right. And right. so and I, and I and I know that that is the case in, in, in a lot of circumstances because I've taken some of those reports myself. So I, I think that that might be helpful. Um, it seems like that's not data that we have today, but that could be something just to, to put a pin in and see is that something that, you know, we're able to to accomplish in the future. And again, the point is, is to try and see where we can best be proactive and then and then get the assistance of our partners. Uh, once again, in an area that the police police officers um, are are not going to be the best first line of defense in preventing this from happening. We are great at responding to after the fact, right, and follow up and, and um, trying to track somebody down, getting the evidence together, taking somebody into custody, um, and then maybe preventing subsequent because, right, we've, we've got a suspect in custody or we're, we're getting restraining orders and all of that. But the first initial incident um, and, and, and how that's happening, where that's happening, police officers are not, are not necessarily the, the best equipped to be our, our preventative measure. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just mention that um, I, I think that none of us were prepared for the pandemic. And so, um, you know, I, I, I will differ with Council Member Renas that I, I would not have expected you to be prepared to, you know, ramp up or respond to the increase that I think we did absolutely see and then now subsequently after the fact we're 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 all in agreement that yes that pandemic that situation over the last couple of years has driven particular crimes like domestic violence as well um, to be on the rise because of the nature of it um, but I recognize that just as I was not prepared for um, you know the the past couple of years I don't expect the the police department to have been there but we can learn from now what has happened, and, and that that applies to more situations than just a pandemic. Um, and regardless, pandemic or not, these are crimes that, that we want to be able to, to, to address and, and help to reduce. And I do believe that we should be doing um, all in our power to, to do so, which includes uh, what we can do, but also includes our, our partners and in, in considering the, the numbers, I do think we, we likely need to engage with our school and school districts much more that proactive um, education is something that will be helpful, not only to potential victims, but as we know, um, some of the potential future suspects. And, and hopefully we can prevent um, those individuals from even becoming uh, a suspect or a perpetrator on, in these types of crimes. And because and, um, that, I think, is, is, is the other side of the, the coin here. Um, going now to the redistricting i am uh bummed to, to to hear the the lack of progress on this um we can never predict how many respondents we'll get on an rfp and so it, it is what it is in that regard and i would not ask or expect 
our city staff to accept a respondent that it's, it's not qualified. And so that also is what it is, right? If, if we ultimately don't find um, now the one of one uh, to be qualified, then I would agree with, you know, the, the uh, response to be that we have to go back out again. I just would hope that we don't just simply reissue, right? That we, if that's the case, then we, we, we need to pause a little bit and see what is, a, what is the best way to maybe go about this. Do we have to go out and try to market it better and see who else uh, maybe out there that didn't apply this round that, that could apply. Um, time certainly is continuing to to be delayed in this. And and that, in my mind, what that does, that just kind of further delays our opportunity to adequately staff our our community because, you know, we are in a, a tough spot today as has been, you know, shared in the news and, and certainly we talked about on Tuesday here on the, on the dais on the issues with staffing. And I don't think this is going to be, you know, the, 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 the savior of all of that, but it will help. It will help to have better and a better idea of where we should be allocating our resources, how we can redraw those lines of our districts and our beats. And, um, and, and so I would like to, to see that progress. Um, and so hopefully we'll, I'll ask you if, you, if you don't mind then, if before the end of the year, so that at least this committee can get one last update, could be November or December then, on um, on the RFP progress, so um, and I imagine you'll you'll have an update at least on the decision of this, you know, individual and then and then or this uh, respondent and then what comes next by that point. I will provide you every bit of information I have. It's part of my bi-monthly, so um, I'll keep reporting out to you. I know they're going to meet in three to four weeks. Okay, and then whatever update I have. So November, you're expected to come back to this anyways on the bi-monthly. Okay, I, I okay. That, so, that's yeah. perfect. I, I, I have my bon bi-monthly in November. Okay, that is that is perfect. All right, that's all my questions, comments. So uh, we have a motion and a second. If we can get a roll call vote, please. Adanas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we have item D2, our Domestic Violence Prevention and Awareness Annual Report. And we're welcoming down uh, our Deputy Chief Washburn, Lieutenant Ceballos, and our Program Director from YWCA, uh, Lindsay Mansfield. Good afternoon, councilmen and committee. My name is uh, Lieutenant Juan Ceballos, and I am the commander of the Family Violence Unit at the San Jose Police Department. Good afternoon, council members. Lindsay Mansfield, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of healing and justice with YWCA. And yes, today we're here to discuss our domestic violence prevention and awareness annual report. So here at the Family Violence Unit, our goal is to use a multidisciplinary approach to, that integrates effective investigation and support to service, services to survivors of family violence in a safe and friendly environment. So the Family Violence Unit is off-site from the police department. We're located at the Family Violence uh, Center, located at 1671 the Alameda and at Suite 100. We are open to the public on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from eight to five. We also have updated our website at sjpd.org where you can report crime and you can see resources under our domestic violence uh, tab. So at the Family Violence Unit, we have three details that conduct investigations. The domestic violence or intimate partner violence team, 
We have our threats management detail, which is domestic violence restraining order violations. They investigate stalking, threats, and workplace violence. And our third team is the child, elder, and dependent adult abuse that investigate physical abuse, neglect, and conduct uh, en enforcement on um, endangerment. So our partner agencies that we have at our Family Violence Center is the Department of Family Services and the Children's Services, along with the YWCA, and we partner with our domestic violence team at the District Attorney's Office. In, in addition to these partners, we also partner with Next Door Solutions, Community Solutions, and many, many other organizations. So our constant goal here is improving services to intimate partner violence survivors. At the Family Violence Center, we have a full-time bilingual advocate from the YWCA who's on site that conducts counseling, lethality assessments, safety planning, uh, restraining order assistance. Uh, during this fiscal year of 2021-2022, our advocate completed 1,441 follow-ups. And out of these follow-ups, approximately 641 referrals were made to survivors. Now, the YWCA also establishes a 24-hour hotline for survivors to call in, uh, including uh, members of the San Jose Police Department, so we can connect survivors to an advocate. And I'll have Lindsay talk a little bit more on this. Thank you. Yeah. So as you know, YWCA strategically collaborates with various partners. Um, and we do that so that we have multiple points of entry into services. You can see the statistics here referencing the reports that we, we received from San Jose PD. In addition to that, we had just under 1,900 domestic violence calls to our hotline from San Jose residents during fiscal year 21-22. Um, Lieutenant Ceballos mentioned our, our coordinator, our advocate there, Adriana. She's really a hub that ensures connection to culturally and linguistically um, appropriate and relevant services. And we do that through partnership as well through the DBAC agencies. So Aki, Nextdoor, Community Solutions, and Maitri. When survivors opt into YWCA services, Adriana is really connecting them to those critical services, housing, childcare, HealthWorks programs, and legal and financial supports. And I think equally impactfully, um, she's reminding survivors of their choice, voice, and strengths. Okay, our next slide is a representation of our domestic violence reported incidents in fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Now, we, we break these down by the four categories in domestic violence. Uh, we have domestic battery, which is a misdemeanor battery where there's no injuries. Um, and we received 899 of these cases, which represented 20%. Our next category is domestic violence with a minor injury or complaint of pain. Uh, and that was our highest at 1,747 cases, which makes up 39%. Our domestic violence with serious bodily injury or a weapon was at 526 cases, 51 of those cases involved a firearm, and that made up 11%. And then our violation of restraining order was at 1,347, which represented 30% of our total cases, which was 4,519. Our next slide is a comparison of our domestic violence incidents the green graph, the green bar here represents fiscal year 2020 through 2021. And the blue graph represents fiscal year 2021 through 2022. Of the category of our misdemeanor battery domestic violence, we had an increase of 14.5%. In the next category were domestic violence and we had a minor injury, that was an increase of 8.2%. And then in the domestic violence with a serious bodily injury or a weapon, that increased by 16.6%. The violation of restraining orders, that dropped 10.6% uh, from the previous year. So this was an overall increase in our domestic violence reporting by 3.7%.
A correlation to the increase here is according to the Department of Justice report in crimes in California for 2021, domestic violence had trended higher and that increased by 2.7%. Another correlation uh, to this increase in numbers is our intersectionality tool. As Lieutenant Donahue had said earlier, we'll cover that in the next slide. So the department recognized intersectionality between domestic violence, sexual assaults, and human trafficking. So we created a form that capitalized these three type of uh, crime activity. So officers go on scene at, at a domestic violence. Not only are they investigating domestic violence, but they're asking questions to survivors regarding sexual assault or prior sexual assaults or human trafficking. And likewise, when officers are on scene of a sexual assault investigation, they're asking about prior history of domestic violence. And this form became mandatory towards the end of quarter two in 2021. And as you can see by our graph here, it gradually started to increase towards the end of the fourth quarter of 2022. So we can say that as a result of this inter inter in intersectionality tool, we were able to identify approximately 104 sexual assault survivors and approximately five human trafficking cases. Now, because of this intersectionality tool, these survivors would not have been identified or these incidents would not have been identified if it wasn't for the officers asking these additional questions and conducting a thorough investigation. So by identifying these additional um, incidents were better able to connect with our survivors with the appropriate resources. And we had a total of 2,960 forms filled out in this last fiscal year, 2021-2022. Uh, our next slide is our domestic violence high-risk response team. And our goal here is to reduce lethality and improve services delivery to our intimate partner uh, violence survivors by having a YWC app advocate available 24 seven. And I'll let Lindsay again cover a little bit more about the high risk. Thank you. Yes, as you may know, I've been part of this team from the start. It's a very critical program. Um, survivors that are at high risk of death from their partner is something that um, we absolutely, you know, care about and want to see a reduction. Lethality is terrifying for the individual, um, but it's also for the community. Um, this is an incredibly critical program, and it's one where we can plant a seed with someone that's in one of the most dangerous circumstances possible. Uh, YWCA and San Jose PD have stayed committed to collaborating and continuing to work through what domestic violence high-risk response looks like in this county, in this city. When survivors opt into services at the time of incident, they're getting immediate safety planning, crisis counseling, resources such as emergency, motel, transportation. Um, sometimes they may be exhausted in the moment and actually not opt in to receiving services from us. And that's one of the reasons that we talk about the Family Violence Center because we do provide follow-up in every case where a survivor has experienced this so that we can reach out a couple of days later when maybe they're not as exhausted and they're open to hearing about options. Um, and getting connected to services like ongoing counseling, case management, and connection to housing resources. Okay, slide number eight is our office. The Office of the City Auditor made some recommendations in a March 2021 report uh, that Lieutenant Donahue referred to. It's advocate referrals, further improvements to the process, and data sharing can help connect more survivors to services. So we accepted all these recommendations and started implementing them. I highlighted here a few of them. So we've updated our duty manual sections to the trauma-informed approach. We now have the IPV strangulation program in place at Valley Medical Center. So survivors of strangulation can go to Valley Medical Center and a safe procedure, a safe exam will be conducted to capture and, and to treat these injuries that, that are a high uh, case of, of mortality. 
Um, our safe procedures now are in place where if a survivor wants an exam conducted, we're going to provide that, and it doesn't matter when the incident occurred. Um, we've updated our, our department patrol supplemental template to include a gun violence restraining order and to offer the safe exam. And during the safe exam, we also provide advocacy. We also updated our resource cards, which is known as the purple cards. Um, these cards are now in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese. Um, there's a lot of information contained in these cards of advocacy referrals and people to contact. Um, in these cards, we also implemented that its survivors are free, they get free service. Um, and survivor's immigration status does not affect the right to services. And survivors also have a right to an advocate during these interviews. So that's been updated in these cards now. Our information sharing with our advocate partners, again, the YWCA, the Family Violence Unit, we belong to several committees and focus groups that conduct monthly meetings. Uh, we belong to the Santa Clara Domestic Violence Council, the Santa Clara County Domestic Violence Protocol, and even this morning, we had the Domestic Violence Death Review Team. Uh, just recently, we created what's called a warm referral. It's an electronic sharing file with our Family Violence Unit members and our in-house advocate, Adriana. So she gets a copy now electronically of the police report that contains all the data that she needs to provide advocacy to our survivors. And it also identifies these high lethality cases so she can prioritize uh, what referrals need to be conducted and how quickly. So it's also going to capture when that follow-up is conducted. So this warm referral would be measurable uh, as we move forward in this. Uh, to the right here, again, is a picture of our four cards that were recently replaced with, with the four different languages containing the information we just stated. Um, this photo on the right, th these are family violence unit detectives that just recently participated in family uh, in the national night out. Um, so we're sending our detectives out. Uh, our goal here is the alignment of our city resources to maximize domestic violence services. So again, at the family violence unit, we investigate for successful prosecution. While detectives are conducting follow-up, our YWCA is providing advocacy, counseling, lethality assessment, safety planning, and other victim services, right, like restraining order assistance. We're in constant communication with our domestic violence DA partners, and we follow up with the patrol officers by providing them with feedback, whether they did a good job on a domestic violence investigation or it was subpar, and we said, hey, this you could have done this better. Um, the family violence just recently created a quarterly newsletter, uh, and we're constantly re uh, updating training bulletins and going to briefings, reminding of this trauma-informed approach. And this goes back to the successful prosecution. Our crime prevention strategies, strategies aim to work with our partner agencies, organizations, and the community to create these healthy relationships by educating teens to prevent future violence. Again, our crime prevention unit has been going out, conducting presentations in schools and the community center. And again, the family violence unit, the YWCA, victim services, members from the DAs and many other organizations just participated in this national night out, conducting outreach uh, in various locations across the city. And that is our presentation. So thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. And uh, first we'll go to members of the public. And just as a reminder, this is item D2, the Domestic Violence Prevention and Awareness Annual Report. And I'll ask first if we have any members present in the audience. There's no members in the audience. Okay, we'll go to Zoom. There are currently no hands up. Okay, we'll come back to members of the committee. And I think uh, Vice Chair Jimenez, if you can be quick. Yeah, just a quick question. Well, thank you for all the information and for the work you guys are doing. Uh, obviously, very important work. On slide four, the, the pie chart, 
So one of the things, I, I just wanted to better understand the numbers. So for example, the 30%, right, it says violation of restraining orders. And then as an example, 39% domestic violence with minor injury. So, so I'm trying to understand how the numbers are counted. So I, I Im imagine that some of the domestic violence with minor injuries, some of that involved a violation of a restraining order maybe. And or, or how, how is it, how are you guys parsing out some of that information as it relates to? So the percentage, the percentages here are just based on the pie graph to equal the whole. So that's but are we double counting the areas? Like, if, you know what I mean? Maybe yeah, I'm not asking it well, but. Some domestic violence will have uh, restraining order violations, right? Okay. But, but that is that is captured separately, right? Each right. one of those charges is. So, for example, itself. so for example, if there was an incident in, in the thirty nine percent, right, the the bottom right, yep. domestic violence with minor injury it, at the seventeen forty seven, right? That's right. the number. That's right. the raw number. Um, and if in one of those there was a violation of a restraining order, that would also be counted in the. 1347 number and the 1347 number yes yeah would be counted because it's it's categorized okay within the restraint order violation okay okay yeah okay I, and it i wasn't a math major like some of the folks yeah. ever so i try to <laughs> wrap my head around some of the stuff okay so that that i i think i understand i think i understand the, the other question i had is on slide nine um I was trying to follow, and I think we've seen this before, and I apologize, I've never asked this before, but so the, the alignment of city resources to maximize domestic violence services. So on the left side, we have the family violence unit. Obviously, you know, at the top, we have investigate for successful pro prosecution. In my mind, that sort of falls at the tail end of some of the work, right? Or, but the way it's structured, but you go to advocacy, victim services, DA partnership, follow up with patrol officers. I was, can you say a little bit more about that? I was trying to understand in the context of some of the work you guys are doing, how that plays out. And there's another question I have as it relates to that, but I want to make sure I understand what you were saying. So again, the, the family violence unit detectives get the case once the incident has already occurred. Right. We get the case for follow up. Um, and we're receiving cases where patrol officers are doing an outstanding job. They're meeting all the requirements. But in some cases, they might forget to, to offer an EPRO or restraining order, or they didn't call for an advocate. So we're going back and we're providing that feedback and say, hey, you did have a violation of, of uh, domestic violence here, you know. You should have gone and made an arrest. And so, so that is that advice is or feedback is given to patrol officers that are going out doing the follow up. No, no, no. Or, or the initial investigation. If Whoever you did the initial investigation. I understand. So okay. we follow up with that officer and the supervisor. So I get it. Again, if you if you miss something in this case, then we're going to follow up and catch it. But you're going to go out to another domestic violence. Now, don't do the same thing. I understand. Make sure that you conduct a thorough And it's you all from the family violence unit who's sort of monitoring, giving that feedback to the officers that are responding to some of these calls for going and, out. And the district attorney. Right. Yes. Okay. All right. And I guess my question, it doesn't fit neatly into what I was thinking you meant, but uh, obviously, I think all of us would, <laughs> would agree we probably don't have as many officers as we should, especially on patrol, and there's pay cars out there and, and, and things of that nature. How does, how does that challenge that exists that we've been trying to solve as a city for many years impact some of this work that goes on on the street as it relates to, well, maybe not follow-up, but some of the work? Again, it didn't fit neatly to what I thought you were describing, but, but I guess maybe the broader question, if I can just ask it more succinctly, is just simply, we need more officers, we know that. I think everyone would agree with that. Um, but, and knowing that and acknowledging that, how does that impact some of the work you're doing, if at all? If I may, uh, Council Member Jimenez, and, and good afternoon, everybody, and um, Chairperson and members of the public. I'm Elle Washburn, Deputy Chief. I'm the Bureau Chief of Investigations. And I think one way to answer your question is yes, you know, we do have, um, we are constantly trying to, you know, recruit officers for the police department and certainly officers go to patrol. And then we look to supplant investigative units, particularly those units that um, investigate and provide services for survivors around intimate partner violence. I think this is a great question to highlight uh, the importance of our work with our advocates, the importance of our work in um, 
first and foremost with our other bureau, the Bureau of Field Operations and the Crime Prevention Unit and the outreach that they do. Um, and for us, it's important to have our in-house advocates and you know, we always appreciate the fact that we have support from council in having um, personnel in-house specifically to expand our capacity um, as, a, as a lean police department. And Lindsay Manfield here is a perfect example of that. Another example is the fact that in this coming fiscal year, we're looking to um, add a full-time employee as a forensic analyst who can help us to identify crime trends and provide meaning. So while it is important, absolutely, to have detectives, I think it's a, a part of a, it's part of a whole system, you know, and if you look at that slide nine, that feedback loop that Lieutenant Ceballos mentioned is really important. So not only are we doing our job, but we are constantly looking to improve, looking to collaborate and uh, work with our non-governmental non organizations and our community partners to increase our capacity with what we have. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. The, the other question I had is, as it relates to some of the follow-up with the investigating officers, are there any trends that we see as to why maybe officers at, aren't asking X, Y, or Z, or why they didn't go the extra step and offer this or that? A anything that stands out uh, that you all are, are tracking as it relates to some of the common, I don't want to call them mistakes, but common maybe shortcomings in, in the amount of interaction between the the... the person impacted by the crime and the officer. Yeah, I mean, we have a young department now, uh, and you know, so the training is, is key. Um, and again, it's a domestic violence scene can be so many moving parts and, and you know, with a good team, they're divvying up some of the responsibilities like, hey, can you go photograph uh, the injuries for me or, and the scene while I'm taking the victim statement? Can you contact the the on-call judge and get the restraining order. Um, and then, but there's usually one person that's assigned the general offense report, the police report. So they should be collecting everything that everybody else did so they can document that. Um, is there times where somebody did miss something? Yeah, absolutely. But, but we're there um, in that circle that when the report comes to the family violence unit, the detectives are definitely picking up on that and then they're addressing that issue. But we'll go back and address the issue when we go to patrol briefings, and again, re-educating, retraining the personnel and briefing, saying, hey, here's what we want to see. Uh, and we are seeing some of that, because they're responding back with that positive feedback. And if, if I might add, you know, certainly it's not left to chance. Um, we have supervisors out at the scene that should be monitoring the overall investigation um, and so present and active supervision is really critical to the department um, running at full efficiency and full capacity with what we have. And, you know, and we recognize that priority. And for example, there we have a um, supervisor retreat for lack of a better term coming up where every sergeant in the department is expected to attend this one day course where expectations of the department are being reviewed. It is really the most important role that we have in the police department is frontline supervision. And that plays a really important role to ensure that the patrol officers on scene are not intentionally or unintentionally taking shortcuts. For example, in gun violence restraining orders or in uh, emergency protective restraining orders. Okay, all right, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you. Back to Zoom, I don't see any other hands up. Um, I'll move approval, the acceptance of the, Thank of the you. report. We have a motion. I did see a Councilmember Dennis hands up uh, or hand go up. I'll, I'll second. Go ahead, Councilmember Dennis. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I have some questions about the um, domestic violence high risk response team. I know that um, the the team halted the the deployment of the advocates in the field. Um, for a period of time during the pandemic. And I'm wondering if there were any cost savings that resulted because of this. And, um, and the reason I ask this is that this, this particular team is on a year to year basis, funded on a year to year basis. And so I, I'd like to see this become more permanent, um, but I'm wondering if we're gonna have to ask for another request in this upcoming fiscal year. Um, 
for the, the domestic violence high risk response team to continue to do its work with the with the advocates. Yes. So the high risk response team uh, for fiscal year 22 23 was approved and it's ongoing now. So we'll have that in place moving on to the next fiscal year. Are you saying that it's uh, permanently funded? Yes, they said it was approved for fiscal year 2022 2023 adopted into the operating budget. Oh my God. Okay. Well, this is, I'm sorry. I must have missed the, this is huge. Well, this is wonderful. Um, and it did I, go, it did go from one time to ongoing now. Okay. Th I think that's what I missed is I knew that it was like on a one-time basis, but now it's on ongoing. I, I, somehow, I don't know how I missed that. Um, but this is, this is wonderful. So now we don't have to look at any savings. We don't have to Think about uh, how we're going to cover the, the the upcoming year. So this is this is great. This kind of really stabilizes this um, uh, this response um, and the way that we interact with with survivors out there of uh, of intimate partner violence. And so uh, w one of the things that I was I was at, I was wondering about is on on table four um, that you all presented. If we go to that one, there is a um, cases involving firearms um, and there is a category of firearm not stated or other firearm uh, and I'm just wondering are those where do ghost guns or you know those kind of manufactured guns what what category do those fall under are they called properly uh, like are they can just considered a gun no matter whether it's a ghost gun or not I mean we would consider them a regular firearm right if it's operable and it's able to discharge a projectile, projectile, then it would be considered a firearm. Um, of these incidents, I don't think we captured whether they were specifically ghost guns or mm -hmm. as opposed to a regular regular firearm. Okay, got it. All right. I was just wondering if if um, if that was tracking as as kind of a trend, but I guess it, it isn't. And I'm glad to see that. Um, I know that this is um, this pandemic and creating an isolation for um, survivors of uh, domestic violence or into partner violence is the perfect um, conditions for this kind of crime to continue to happen um, and to escalate. And so. Uh, I'm glad to see that um, people are not uh, um, providing their own, well, are not making their own um, guns um, uh, or shifting in the way that they um, create violence uh, for these survivors. So um, I appreciate that. I do think that there is something that we could be doing proactively, not only just for sexual assault, but also for intimate partner violence. And while we can't uh, prevent crimes, um, I think that there's also uh, an opportunity for us to create messaging um, around how to prevent that. I mean, this all speaks to some of the really great work that our crime prevention specialists are doing around healthy relationships. And that is a way to mitigate, um, or at least, at the very least, provide some resources for folks that are to continue to be stuck at home, if you will, um, with a perpetrator. Is there anything that we've thought about doing through social media on an ongoing basis, not just, you know, one, you know, one once a month, I mean, not once a year when there is um, a proclamation or a, um, a recognition of intimate partner violence, but throughout the year have something that pops up and maybe it doesn't have any, any um, audio with it, but it's uh, it's something that pops up in social media or TikTok or whatever, you know, whatever means that we think that women are, whatever social media that um, women tend to uh, go to a little bit more, just so that they have the, the more um, local and current numbers. I know that the, the county is working on some crisis intervention 
um, phone numbers um, and uh, and so I'm wondering what what kind of work are we doing or do you, do you know if our partners have that on an ongoing basis? This is Deputy Chief L. Washburn. Um, you know, to my knowledge, we don't have any ongoing social media um, public service announcements as it relates to domestic violence or family violence. I know we often celebrate, you know, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we um, are engaged with our media relations unit, who does presently manage our social media accounts and our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, I know, for example, the Special Victims Unit, which is human trafficking, um, has specific funding that they receive, and they do a lot of advertising at the airport, for example. I think we're always looking for uh, ways to leverage technology, specifically. Mm -hmm the prevalence of the internet and social media right. to try to, do, to conduct community outreach. Um, and that is something that we can continue to have conversations mm -hmm. with our crime prevention unit um, mm -hmm. to ensure that we're leveraging technology, you know, specifically yeah. because it is a very ubiquitous form of communication for our youth and adolescents and a way to reach them if they're not coming to community events. Well, that's definitely how I communicate with my 14 year old <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> so I have to uh, send him some texts. Wake up, please. <laughs> um, DC Washburn, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. When, I think there we need to have a very active um, campaign around this uh, to make it easier on, uh, this is not a solve, you know, this is not something that our police department's gonna solve. Um, it is definitely a way to mitigate some of these crimes and or maybe route the, um, some of these survivors or, or folks who are still in, in the middle of, of some of these um, very precarious situations to advocates that can uh, create safety plans or can provide them resources that they're not necessarily coming to the police department. We don't want them to come our way. We want them hopefully to have other alternatives and other pathways. Um, so I think it would be a, a, a really wonderful investment. I hope that we can maybe talk about this offline, but I think this is some this is something where I think our city manager um, and I'll I'll lobby um, our, our our city manager uh, representative that's uh, with us today to to ask about that because I think. You know, when we take a look at the um, what it costs to be to respond to many of these crimes and um, and uh, and the prevention that goes with it, you know, the prevention always um, far outweighs in terms of costs, whether it's emotional or just monetary. Is, is there something that that we can continue to do at this at the same time while we are um, preparing? Uh, I mean, not preparing, but just uh, supporting our police officers with trauma-informed training, with, you know, intersectionality tools, uh, just with all of these different tools to, to help um, better serve our survivors and, and, um, and, to, uh, and themselves um, to be able to go through some of these incidents. Couldn't we invest in a social media campaign that, that is also running on an ongoing basis rather than just as a response to a request? Well, I definitely think to your point about having a, a conversation offline about how we might uh, ensure that our social media presence around domestic violence awareness and prevention is robust, I think is real important. Mm -hmm. um, I know earlier somebody mentioned our YouTube channel where you know, we do a lot of outreach in, regarding teen dating violence awareness month and mm -hmm. um, emphasizing, I think there was a PSA as it relates to the, the YWCA. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there are a number of uh, s platforms or, you know, vehicles via social media right. and the internet that we absolutely can leverage. So I think to your point, it's important to know kind of um, situationally, what are we already doing mm -hmm. and wh where are the gaps? And so I think it would be important to, to continue to have that conversation for sure, to see where we might um, close up some of those gaps. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right, DC uh, Washburn. I think it's, uh, for, first of all, we have to be strategic, right? And so we have to take a look at what we're already doing and then where are those gaps are. And then who we have access to, right? In our community centers, there's youth that comes in and out and we could have, you know, videos that are running uh, certain messages or, or, or videos. Um, and so it, the, this is a real, I think this is a really good question for us to ask. And I think um, um, a tool that, that isn't as expensive as maybe hiring or, um, or, you know, or adding advocates or anything of that sort, but it's really just education. And it may not be um, what we uh, do uh, on an everyday basis, but we can bring in partners that uh, certainly do this um, on an ongoing and a daily basis and have them be those those folks um, out there doing uh, the messaging for us. So is there any chance, um, Lee, that this can go with our PIO um, uh, work plan? Yes, thank you, Council Member. I, I was just thinking the same thing. As you know, we were pretty purposeful about limiting um, social media presence and communication during the pandemic to really focus on boosters and, and all the other services. Mm -hmm. And so we've we've been also very purposely kind of giving everyone a little bit of a reprieve from some of the output from the city based off of kind of mm -hmm. some of the data mining that we were doing. Um, but again, these are important messages. So I'm going to ask um, you know, Deputy Chief Washburn and Carolina to take a look at this and see how uh, city manager's office PIO kind of supports PD with this because I do think there's some tools and some strategies um, that are pretty low cost to get um, mm -hmm. this across. Yeah, I, I certainly don't want our number getting blocked by most of our residents. So I agree that we have to be very strategic, but I think this is this is another tool that I don't know that we've necessarily relied on on a consistent basis. So I think we, we need to test the waters um, and just get in there. Uh, so, you know, those are, those are my, oh, no, those were not my questions because I have one additional question. On the healthy relationships, that were there, uh, and those um, workshops that were provided, were there any locations that, that, um, that were strategic in nature because the, the data told us to, to kind of go there or were, what were the locations or how were the locations determined? Or, or were these Zoom? No, on these locations, like specifically for National Night Out, I definitely looked at where our peaks were and that's where I sent our family violence uh, personnel. So in the photo uh, where the two family violence units, uh, that was at Round Table and Rotor in uh, our Southern Division. So I specifically said, we're, we're gonna go to that one. Um, out in Foothill, we obviously have the big one at Presh Park, mm -hmm. but we also went to Pokeaway and McCreary again, because those locations were strategic and, and where we're seeing some of our, our domestic violence. Mm. Got it, okay. I I interesting. I know that domestic violence, uh, um, is not partial to any particular group, but that's interesting that, that and I'm, I'm grateful that you're using that data to drive this strategy, um, which I find very effective. Uh, I'd like to just speak offline to see if there's any, any um, uh, zones in, in my district that, that you would alert me to. Um, anyways, those, those were my questions. Thank you so much for the report. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, don't see any other hands. Um, and apologize, I did not introduce you, Captain Dwyer, uh, when you came up, but uh, thank you for being here as well. Um, no questions for you either, so you're safe. Um, but thank you for the, the presentation and my colleagues for their uh, in-depth questioning. Um, I, I just had one, which was in regards to this crime prevention component and considering the last presentation and conversation we had. I'm curious in this education portion to our teens, preventing future violence, how much of that crossover do, do we include on sexual assault or is it broad enough to sort of already include that? I'm just curious on that. Um, it, it can be broad, obviously from the family violence unit, you know, we know because of this intersectionality tool, right? It, it crosses. 
So um, these presentations can be conducive to specifically one or the other or bring them both together uh, and, and getting that education, you know, in, in the schools, which would hopefully translate that we can reduce some of this violence, right, from, from occurring once they get older. So uh, crime prevention does a good job, but again, it's specific to what it is that the presentation is going to be focused on but certainly both can be crossed with each other. Yeah, I think we would be wise to take advantage of those opportunities, even if it wasn't the focus, for instance, of a conversation, if we really wanted to focus on domestic violence, um, I think it would be wise to have a component, right, that, that also, even if briefly, discusses um, sexual assault, sexual violence, and, and intimate partner violence, and, and, and the crossover there. And similarly, if we were to have a focus in, in that area, you know, as as was stated, that intersectionality is, is present anyways. This is just a unique opportunity that we might have where we can provide some education and prevention. And so, uh, again, considering that last conversation, I think it would be wise to to take advantage of those opportunities to to you know, provide some some info in, in different areas of, of concern for us. All right, that was it for me. And we do have a motion and a second. So we'll do a roll call vote. Adenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Jimenez? Yes. And Perales? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, next up will be item D3, our technology related violence mitigation status report. We have a new crew coming down, so we'll shift. Welcome. We have uh, Deputy Chief Ed Schroeder, our uh, Deputy Director uh, Judy Tirico, and our Division Manager Frank uh, Karua. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, Committee Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Members, Members of the Public. Uh, my name is Frank Karub. I'm the Division Manager of the San Jose Police Department's Crime Data Intelligence Center, which is part of the Office of the Chief of Police. Um, with me today are my colleagues, Deputy Chief Ed Schroeder. Uh, he's the Executive Officer of the Department and also under the uh, Office of the Chief of Police. And um, Deputy Director Judy Tirico from our Bureau of Technical Services. The San Jose Police Department recognizes the value of leveraging technology to support investigations that positively impact public safety, while at the same time protecting the privacy of the citizens we were sworn to serve. Today, I'd like to give you a status report on a few technology-related violence mitigation projects employed by the San Jose Police Department and explain how those projects integrate with the City of San Jose's privacy policy. As offenders become more innovative and advanced in how they commit crime, the police department must counter with mitigation strategies to disrupt and investigate criminal behavior. To that end, the police department is currently piloting two categories of technology, automated license plate readers and gunshot audio detection. What are automated license plate readers? Automated license plate readers are cameras that take still photographs of moving objects as they pass by. They're typically used in intersections or at ingress and egress points in cities. They capture the license plate, and in some cases, the make, model, color, and distinguishing characteristics of vehicles as they pass. They do not employ any um, other technologies like facial recognition, but rather just capture the vehicle itself. What is gunshot audio detection? Gunshot audio detection is a tool that's used to tri triangulate audio signals of gunshots that are recognized by um, the technology built into the system. 
they were they learn over time to distinguish between false positives of fireworks um, and construction noise, other sounds that may interfere with um, the uh, proper identification of gunshots. They're used as a tool to more rapidly respond to um, firearms offenses in neighborhoods, to provide services and support to victims that may be suffering, and to immediately uh, alert the police department of gunshots before uh, citizens are able to dial 911. Some of the technology-related violence mitigation projects I'd like to discuss today are, first, the V5 Systems Gunshot Detection Pilot, second, the Curtner Avenue and Monterey Road Pedestrian Safety Pilot, third, the UASI Grant-Funded Gunshot Detection and ALPR Pilot, and last, the American Rescue Plan-Funded ALPR Project. The V5 Systems Gunshot Detection Pilot was installed on May 1st in 2021 in the Cadillac Winchester neighborhood in San Jose. It combined gunshot detection, ALPR, and video cameras. It was designed for continuous monitoring and real-time alerting. Community outreach was generally well received and done in the neighborhood and also citywide. However, and unfortunately, inadequate tech support from V5 proved to be detrimental to the project. V5, the vendor, became insolvent during the pilot and failed to support the system. And however, the technology itself proved to be a valuable public safety tool. Before going on to the other three projects, I'd like to talk a little bit about the digital use protocol um, that is um, that was written, has not been approved yet by council. I believe it's um, on the council agenda next Tuesday, the 20th of September. It addresses authorized uses, prohibited uses, operational procedures, how data is collected, how data is audited, how data is shared between different police agencies. Notice that's provided to folks that uh, license plate may be uh, read and used in a criminal investigation, retention, storage and minimization, equity and accountability, and the training that and community engagement employed throughout the process. Each of the next three projects fall under the umbrella of the digital use protocol. First, the Curtner Avenue and Monterey Road pedestrian safety pilot. That was brought to city council by council member Esparza in September of 2021. This was in response to multiple vehicular fatalities and hit and run collisions at that intersection. Flock safety cameras were purchased via a non-competitive bid, which was under $10,000. In May of 2022, four cameras were installed at Curtner Avenue and Monterey Road. Extensive community outreach began in July and is ongoing. What you see to the left of the slide there is a flyer announcing a traffic safety camera Zoom webinar that took place on August 24th. More than 200 families were reached in person during the extensive community outreach. Over 100 people registered for that citywide Zoom. There were well over 150 views in multiple languages on YouTube. Next is the UASI grant funded gunshot detection ALPR pilot. This is a UASI funded project. The funding allows for coverage of six neighborhoods with gunshot detection devices and corresponding ALPR cameras. In June, the project team met to discuss neighborhood placement, department-wide usage and implementation as anticipated in December of 2022. Additionally, I'd like to mention that in May of 2022, ongoing going funding for gunshot detection and ALPR in the Cadillac and Winchester neighborhood was requested and approved which expanded us to seven neighborhoods for gunshot detection devices and corresponding ALPR cameras. Six of those fall under the umbrella of the UASI grant. The selected neighborhoods are Cadillac and Winchester, and these are intersections, McLaughlin and Owsley, Poco and McCreary, Story and Colmar, Rotor and Roundtable, Genie and Forestdale, 
and Guadalupe, Washington. What you see to the left here is an example of the size of the neighborhood um, that would be covered for Jeannie and Forestdale, which is in Central. Um, the pins that you see there are the corresponding, the yellow pins are the corresponding ALPR cameras that would be used to complement the gunshot detection system. The American Rescue Plan funded ALPR project was presented um, to city council and approved uh, for, for citywide ALPR deployment on November 30th of 2022. And, um, excuse me, it was, yes, correct. The funding would allow for purchase of approximately 80, uh, 90 cameras. The RFP was submitted in March of 2022. I'm sorry, 2021 was November 30th of 2021. That's a typo at the top there. RFP was submitted in March of 2022 and City of Purchasing and San Jose PD are currently preparing for competitive procurement process uh, with the American Rescue Plan funded ALPR project. And any questions? Thank you very much. We'll go to members of the public first. And as a reminder, this is on item D3, the technology related violence mitigation status report. <clears throat> oh, and I apologize, actually, we'll go to the audience members first. Do we have any present? There is nobody no. present. Okay, thank you. Now we'll go to Zoom. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. In fact, I was asleep on the last item, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, you had a good one too. Uh, on the first two items today. For this item, uh, I guess to quickly offer, um, there is going to be a VTA study session group on the future of, of violence issues with their buses that I think I should have mentioned, that I wanted to mention in the previous item that I thought I'd take the time to mention here as how to help address you know, your violence questions overall. Um, I personally feel that your ALPR use, your gunshotter, uh, shot spotter technology, uh, we already have a ton of this technology and, uh, you know, the street light uh, system that we're developing, you know, allows for that a lot. So I've always been kind of uh, worried that you continuously talk about the needs of ALPR stopping crime when we already have the tools installed, basically. And so you just want to uh, multiply it times two, times four. And uh, I think that presents problems. I think we should be considering, really considering minimal use practices can really do the same amount of things as a ton of surveillance technology. And uh, that's just uh, important lessons for myself and how to talk about technology for a community. And for instance, uh, at the, uh, BART station, North uh, Berryessa BART station, you have 40 plus shot spotter speakers in the lobby to present kind of an aesthetic architectural vision that if you come into San Jose, you've got to face the man basically. And I don't think that's the right approach. I think, you know, five shot spotter speakers can do the same as 40 plus, And we should really respect those kind of uh, practices and systems of working. Aesthetics with architecture, uh, to offer a plethora of surveillance isn't much of a good answer. Uh, it's kind of a condescending. Thank you. Um, Stratus. Uh, hello. Can you yes, hear me? We can hear you. Okay. This is Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I don't trust my government. And that's healthy. No democracy should. Because the amount of power that is going to be like assumed by the police department and the amount of data that's going to be gathered, what kind of data is going to be gathered, how it's going to be used, how it's going to be aggregated with other data in order to map out certain areas of the city. And then for what reasons? So before we start getting this, you know, uh, using violence and exploiting violence in order to get more technology so that the technology could be used against the citizenry, that's using violence to promote violence because 
to to gather data, make assessments based on that data, and you're not telling the public what you're doing, how you're doing it, or for what purposes, that's violence against the public. Because what can happen and what flows from that is the complete violation of the very things that we say are violated when somebody receives a punch, when somebody receives a kick, or when someone receives a bullet. The same types of violations happen. Just one is physical, and the others are political, economic, and 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 uh, and uh, legislative. So we need to be very, very careful because if you want these technologies, then you have to also assume the responsibility for them. And what that means is very clear policies as to what information is being collected and why, what's being done with it, and not these you know real dry euphemistic terms but very concretely, what are you doing with this information? Because the citizenry should never trust the government. Back to the committee. Thank you. And uh, we'll start with Vice, Vice Chair Jimenez. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, let, let me just first admit, admit that I haven't been following this, <laughs> the issue, the issue on, some on some of the stuff that's going on in the police department uh, very closely. Um, although uh, maybe a, a few weeks ago, someone did reach out to my office uh, to share some concerns about techno the, the cameras and things of that nature. And so I'll ask some questions that are maybe very obvious to some, but maybe not as obvious to me. Um, <clears throat> and so um, there's a lot happening. Uh, I know, for example, the, the intersection at Kirtner and Tully or, or in Monterey and, and all that area, some cameras went in there. I think th there, that particular area, I think there was a total of three cameras or four cameras. And is that, I'm trying to understand, because we talked a lot about different cameras in different places, I think the 90 or so that you mentioned that with, the, with some of the funding from the feds and such. And, and so Flock, I think, was one of the contractors that I guess um, got the pilot with the police department. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But so, so the other 90 that we're going to deploy, are we going to have to enter into a contract with a vendor to, to facilitate the usage of those as well? For the ARP funded cameras will go to competitive bid, yes. Okay, and I suspect Flock is any private company is probably going to throw their hat in the ring and, and want to be involved, right? I, I mean, would expect them so. and a host of others. Okay, and so currently, how many cameras are, is, is it, or actually, let me, let me back up. Is Flock the only private entity that currently has contracts with the city as it relates to some of these cameras and the usage of the data and things of that nature? The fixed cameras, yes. Just the inter intersection of Kirtner and Monterey, there are only four cam fixed cameras in the city of San Jose right now. Uh, however, we do have a, a vehicle mounted system that we've had for about 12 years that's provided by a different vendor. Okay, all right, and, and, and obviously those are on vehicles, right? They're in police um, vehicles. So those four cameras, uh, uh, Monterey and Kurtner, uh, or Tully, right, it's right at the intersection, those are flock, those are? They are. Okay. And that yeah. is a pilot, correct? It is, yes. Okay, all right, and then um, I think you're probably aware of some of the concerns from the ACLU and other folks, uh, entities that have expressed concern. Sure. I'm of the mind that I think technology and cameras can serve a purpose, so I certainly don't have the perspective or share the perspective that we should never have them, they're never appropriate. I, I think they can be used in, in effective ways. And so um, one of the things that I'm curious about, so for example, next week we're getting the uh, data usage or the privacy data policy. I forget the, I used to be on smart cities, it's been a while, but that's coming before us next week. It is, um, yes. And so, Obviously, within those policies, those contain some, some uh, important information as to how we as a city want to approach some of this, the way we're operating the cameras and the usage and the data and privacy, obviously. And so what I'm curious about is, as an example, with the pilot with Flock, how is it that we went about ensuring that the spirit of those policies are built into that contract when we haven't even approved the policy? I'm trying to understand. Sure. Yeah. So we do have a, a current duty manual, um, and, and the, it, it mirrors uh, very closely with the digital use policy that is currently going to be before the city council next week. We put together a committee of people. Uh, three of the people are, are here today, the deputy chief, Ed Schroeder, and, and Judy Tarico, and also our assistant chief, Paul Joseph, uh, the, the city's digital privacy um, officer who's here today, uh, Albert Kahami. And, and others, and what we did was we sat down and we really, really looked at the technology 
and we addressed all of those issues that you mentioned. How, how are we accountable? How can we protect people's privacy? How could the data be audited? Um, how, how can we report out to the public? For example, um, one of the things that we, we really were adamant about is there needed to be some transparency portal for the public, and there is one in the FLOC system where if you go to the, the San Jose PD uh, public-facing internet, you can actually find the transparency portal. It'll tell you how many uh, cars have been read, how many plates have been read, how many searches have been made, which agencies we share with, which agencies share with us. All of those things are addressed in the digital use po uh, policy that you'll that'll be before this uh, this council next week. And you feel fairly confident that uh, those things that we're gonna consider and, and, and approve hopefully next, next Tuesday, that uh, within the existing pilot contract with Flock, that a lot of that was taken into consideration. And if you wanna, sh I know, I know if you want to say anything, please feel free. But you, you feel confident that the spirit of that, that what it's expected to be approved is, is built in into that? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, you know, Flock is used by many agencies um, and jurisdictions in the nine barrier area counties and actually throughout California and the United States. Um, we had an opportunity to meet with some of them and uh, discuss some of their thoughts, concerns, um, case studies, uh, privacy issues, everything that you just mentioned here today. And, and um, you know, it took, it, we spent about a year, uh, pretty close to a year's worth of work on the, this digital use protocol. So a lot of energy effort um, and um, thought went into this. A okay. And I am very confident that, yeah. that we, we capture the spirit of that digital use and we protect the privacy of the folks while, of the community while also um, providing uh, enhanced public safety. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you, Council Member. Nice to see you again, by the way. <laughs> see you as well. Albert Kahami, Digital Privacy Officer. I just want to echo what Frank and the Police Department have said. And on top of that, one of the key elements here, um, and Frank can certainly provide more detail on this, is that Flock, for these pilot cameras and for this agreement, are acting as a steward on behalf of us for the data. And what that means is that we own the data, we use it, we decide how it's being used. And Frank can give the exact date, but I believe it's Flock has access to the data for the first three days and for setup, maintenance checks, and then they can't access it. It's our data. And I, I say that to say that as we designed the data usage protocol, we were able to design it in a way with that in mind. So it's thinking about whether it be Flock or any other entity mm -hmm. that is our contractor, we are the owners of the data and deciding how it's being used. Um, and so I really want to commend the police department because we have spent a lot of time talking through the usage, prohibited, authorized, making sure this aligns with our city's values, bringing it to the public, to our expert privacy task force, and addressing a lot of the concerns, like for example, one of the big concerns with the ACLU around, is this data being shared federally? And the answer to um, our data is no because of course we have a lot of values around that in the city of San Jose. Um, and so those are baked into not only the protocol, but how we've made our agreements with Flock thus far, and whether it be Flock or anyone else in the future, how those will be handled. Okay, and then can, can someone comment on the current agreement with Flock? What, what is the term of that contract, or the pilot, if you will? When, when does that, how long does that carry? It's a one-year pilot. Okay, how far into it are we? We, uh, Not too we, far. we began in May of 2022. Okay, all right, okay. Um, and do you, I imagine the city attorney's office chimed in on the contract and like. Yeah. Carl, I, Carl Mitchell uh, reviewed every document that we've discussed here today. And the reason I mentioned that is just, I'd, I'd assume as well, well, not assume, I guess one of the questions I have is, do we anticipate that some of the future RFPs with the other vendors are gonna, are they going to be modeled after this agreement with Flock that we have, right? Do we, do we think it's sufficient enough to, to cover whatever concerns the city exists, or, or do we envision that whatever new contracts come forward, RFPs that come forward, they're going to be fashioned in a much more, in a different way? I, I think that what, we, what we're really focusing on is um, how the system works, how effective it is, what type of support the company has, the reputation of the company, all those factors that we look at whenever we go through a competitive process, but also whether or not they can provide us with what we need to comply with the digital use protocol. 
of the city. Can they provide us with that type of transparency that we need to, to assure the public that their privacy is being protected and we are the ones that own the data. We are using the data. Uh, for example, Flock has a, um, a uh, box that pops up in their system. I don't know if other vendors have this, that before you could even enter their, their user interface, you have to agree uh, that um, anything that is uh, used or gathered from the system, any data will not be used for any immigration purposes. Okay. It's built into their system. Those are the kind of things we're looking for, um, okay. the ability to create a transparency uh, portal for the public. Okay, very good. And, and the, the only other thing I would say, I'm going to read off a few things, but I, I intend to... There are questions that I have that were brought to my attention for some folks that are watching this closely. And, and I don't often <laughs> do this. If you've been watching us long enough, I don't often, you know, we get a lot of meeting requests and we take those meetings, but these questions to me seem like logical questions that I think we as a city need to answer very publicly. Um, and so I'll submit a memo with these questions, but I'm gonna read off some of the things that, I, that they brought up to me that I, I think we should probably get some clarity on just for the sake of, of transparency and understanding what we're approving. But they asked me questions uh, that concern them that they, they believe need to be answered by the city in which I agree with them in, in the sense, and some of them you touched on. In the, and one of them is like, what's the contract term with Flock, right, as an example? Um, what constitutes a breach with, by Flock? And is there an addendum covering cybersecurity, ransomware, internal protocols? Obviously, they're a company that they can, they're susceptible to breaches just like any other co corporation. Uh, things like that. Also, they touched on definitions. Hardware components are defined in that pilot contract but software components aren't. Is the storage considered hardware or software, right? I mean, that, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, things like that. Uh, what's the definition of anonymized and de-identified data? Does the definition of defect cover incorrect results from some of the readings, for example? Logistical questions such as which party bears responsibility for ensuring that the, data, that the agency data is fully de-identified and anonymized? Um, and so things of that nature, as an example, and I'll just conclude with this, is where is the raw agency data stored um, and which party is responsible for security and the integrity of the data, the raw data? So those seem to me to be logical questions. And so we'll, su we'll submit a memo with some of these questions just so we have it out there and everyone can sort of, you know, take a look at what some of the, what the response is via memo or just a presentation during the course of the meeting. But I just wanted to highlight that. But thank you so much for the work. I think these have a place in our society and our city. I think we just need to be thoughtful as to how they're implemented. But I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Zoom. Not seeing any hands up here. So uh, just coming back, I, I had question on the um, gunshot audio detection technology. Um, I believe you said during that RFP process, uh, V5 systems was the, was the only responder, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Um, did, I, guess, I guess I'm kind of curious, it's obviously after the fact at this point, but curious why we, we didn't maybe pause or go out and try to find um, another partner. Did we have some confidence in V5 at that point, I'm assuming, and we felt comfortable moving forward? We just talked about this right on, the, on a previous item with our redistricting, right, where we only had two respondents. And we're, so just curious on, um, on that, considering we have, right, a, a local company, ShotSpotter, I'm, I'm not sure why they wouldn't have responded. They're, they're local based out of Fremont, right? They've been around for nearly 30 years. So I'm just kind of curious, um, what was our level of confidence at that point? So uh, I think I can't speak for Spot, ShotSpotter, but I can tell you that, that one of the um, factors that we really wanted to be part of that RFP was portability. We wanted the ability to be able to move the system and actually was written into the RFP that after Cadillac and Winchester, uh, it was a six month pilot. After the first three months, we would move it to another neighborhood. And the purpose for that would be to test that portability. How difficult is it to move? Um, did the topography of the neighborhood impact the accuracy of the system? Uh, lots of different factors were, were in play there. ShotSpotter is not a portable uh, a system. It's a, it's a fixed system, and once it's installed, that's where it lives. So um, my guess is that that's why they didn't, uh, weren't one of the competitive um, That was a requirement bidders, in our RFP. Right, it was a requirement. Got it. Um, also, the... Um, 
you know, V5 Systems was well respected and, and we received some testimonials from other agencies about the technology itself. Unfortunately, they went through uh, a financial issue and an acquisition during our pilot, right, right at the very beginning. And um, then they became non-responsive and I think it was because of that. Um, and, and, and we weren't able to solve problems. If there were, uh, you know, maintenance issues that needed to be addressed, a camera went offline or a SIM card uh, went bad in one of the one of the cameras that had to be replaced. There was nobody there to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really, the technology itself proved very valuable. Uh, we were able to, for example, solve a, a homicide case um, with the technology, uh, the V5 technology. However, uh, supporting that technology became non-existent. And then at that point, we, we weren't able to continue on with the pilot. Okay, well, they're completely gone at this point. So there's yeah. no support, no. Um, <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. Um, okay, I, I am curious at the end of the, the, the memo there on this section, you stated that um, alternative vendors will be considered under the future plans. I do think this is a very valuable technology. It sounds like it, right, it, the technology we found it valuable as well. We yes. didn't get exactly what we wanted out of the pilot. Um, maybe the portability limited us right in that. Maybe we remove that, you know, as we move forward. And I, I do think that having this uh, level of technology, at least in some specific areas of the city, will be very valuable. I know we had some community members that were interested in uh, the, you know, the opportunity that this might provide. Um, what does that look like as far as that, that statement of alternative vendors will now be considered? So uh, moving to the, to the UASI funded uh, gunshot detection pilot, that one is um, in process right now. It was a sole source um, name brand um, pilot. And uh, now uh, Flock Systems actually has a gunshot detection component. It's called Raven. And that's what we are piloting, or we will pilot as soon as it's installed. Like I, I mentioned, it, this will be um, a, implemented and installed by December of 2022 uh, in the seven neighborhoods that were identified in the um, PowerPoint. Um, the gunshot detection works in uh, conjunction with the ALPR technology. Uh, the nice thing about uh, having the ALPR uh, system and the gunshot detection system on the same platform is that they are, use the same user interface, which uh, we, can, um, we can access from our MDCs, our mobile data computers in the police cars. So officers on the street, as well as our dispatchers, our analysts, any other folks, investigators in the Bureau of Investigations can log into the system and can access both the ALPR technology in real time uh, and historically uh, and the gunshot detection as well. So we're not, I, I just, I was led to believe by that statement that we were somehow going to go out and maybe explore another RFP or look, we're, we're not. We are simply now looking to migrate that um, technology over to. Um, it, it, it is a pilot. It'll be a one year okay. pilot. At the end of that year, we'll evaluate and decide uh, whether or not to move forward. Okay. Uh, however, the American Rescue Plan funded ALPR project is going out uh, to competitive uh, procurement process, and that should happen soon. And that's, however, that is just ALPR. Okay, yeah, I was not, not so concerned about that. I was more concerned about what the future of um, our gunshot detection technology would look like. Yep. So, okay, that's all the questions that, that I have. I'll check back on our Zoom. Don't see any hands. I don't know if we had a motion on this one. I'll move it forward. Hey, thank you. And can we get a roll call vote, please? Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us to our last action item, which is item D4, our workers' compensation, compensation program annual report. I see, welcome, uh, the Director of Human Resources and Play Relations, Jennifer Shembry and our division manager, Eric Cortez. Good afternoon, Jennifer Shembry, Director of Employee Relations and Human Resources. I'm here with Eric Cortez, the division manager over workers' comp health and safety, and I'm gonna turn it over to him to do the presentation. 
Yes, good afternoon again, Chairperson, committee members, members of the public. Uh, we're here today to provide you with the Workers' Compensation Program Update Annual Report. Our recommendation is that the committee accept the annual report on the city's efforts to contain workers' compensation costs and reduce claims for the workers' compensation program by focusing on wellness, health, and safety through the end of 21-22. Earlier this year, on June 14, 2022, City Council authorized the city manager to negotiate and execute an amendment to extend the current agreement with Intercare for an additional three years through June 30th, 2025, and increase the amount of compensation by $16,618,903 for a total not to exceed amount of $32,582,834. This amendment allowed Intercare to continue to provide comprehensive workers' compensation services and serve as the city's third-party administrator to administer all workers' compensation claims. Staff recommended extending the agreement with Intercare based on their proven ability to offer quality, consistent, and excellent claims administration services. This slide compares the total number of open claims through the end of the past two fiscal years. Through the end of June 30th, 2022, there was a total of 2,575 open claims compared to 2,489 open claims through the end of June 30th, 2021. This accounted for an approximate 3.4% 3 increase year over year. This increase is largely due to the influx of 494 COVID-19 claims reported in 21-22, of which 85 remain open. This slide provides a snapshot of the total number of COVID-19 claims, lost time, medical only and information only, and costs incurred by the city since the pandemic in March of 2020. As you can see, most of the COVID-19 claims, lost time and medical, occurred in the fire and police departments, 268 and 526 claims respectively. The total paid for fire and police was 1,883,212, while total paid for all claims was 1,889,128. This represents approximately 97% of total costs. The total outstanding reserves or anticipated future costs for the remaining open COVID claims was $928,746. This slide re reflects the total workers' compensation costs for 21-22 which totaled $24,262,914. Fire and police costs combined was approximately $19.9 million, or 82% of total workers' compensation costs. The adopted budget of $20,200,500 was exceeded by approximately $4 million. Note that staff was in communication with the budget office throughout the 21-22 year to coordinate authority to settle claims in both the police and fire departments, as it was anticipated that we would exceed both departments' adopted budget. Workers' comp settlements from the general fund totaled more than $3 million during fiscal year 21-22, which we'll review in the next slide. As you can see, this slide represents the general fund workers' compensation settlements for the past fiscal year by department and by cost. The majority of settlements and costs, again, occurred in both police and fire. Fire had over $1 million in settlements, while police had approximately $1.7 million in settlements. The total cost of all settlements was $3,236,360. Workers' comp settlements include compromise and release, or CNR, and stipulations with requests for award, or STIP settlements. The importance of these types of settlements and the impact to the city's future liabilities is discussed when we review the projected ultimate losses slide. This slide represents the estimated outstanding losses and case reserves for the past two fiscal years as reflected in the Aon actuarial study of the city's self-insured workers' comp program. 
Estimated outstanding losses are Aon's projections of cost of all open claims that have not yet been fully paid. The estimated outstanding losses increased by 4.3 million from our prior estimate of 171.9 million as of June 30th, 2021, which was a 2% increase. The case reserves increased by 2.2 million from our prior case reserves of 117.8 million as of June 30th, 2021, which was also a 2% increase. Over the past four years, staff in partnership with CAO and Intercare have focused on CNR and STIP settlements. To determine the impact of these settlements on the projected ultimate losses, staff compared Aon's actuarial study from 2018-19 to the current study of 2021-2022. This slide reflects this comparison and the changes in projected ultimate losses from 2013-14 through 2021-2022. The change showed a decrease of 6.6 .6 million or a 2.5% reduction over the past nine fiscal years. The reduction in projected ultimate losses, which are the total amount expected to be paid in a particular claim period after all the claims are closed, supports the division strategy and focus in settling and reducing future cost exposure via CNR and STIP settlements. While this has increased our cost in the short term, it is an important strategy to decrease our cost in the long term. This slide provides an overview of Intercare's staffing and ratio of assigned claims to staff. As of June 30th, 2022, Intercare had 10 senior examiners handling 1,458 claims for an average of 145.8 cases per examiner and four future medical or medical only examiners handling 1,117 claims for an average of 279.3 cases per examiner. Intercare is well within industry standards for caseloads for their examiners. This slide represents the performance measures for Intercare. On an annual basis, we evaluate Intercare's performance based on the following adjuster technical audit. There are two categories, quality performance and state compliance performance in which each adjuster is evaluated. The overall audit score reflected a slight improvement over the prior fiscal year, 97.5% for this past fiscal year compared to 96% during the previous fiscal year. An audit score between 90 and 100% is considered and exceeds expectations and is the achievable passing score for Intercare. This slide identifies several of the workers' compensation initiatives. The Interconnect program has been suspended since the beginning of the pandemic, but staff looks forward to resuming in January 2023. The purpose of this program is to connect injured workers and claims adjusters face-to-face -to, -face to review their individual claims. Claims reviews with the city's larger departments and Intercare continue on a monthly basis and have proven to be an effective communication collaboration forum to assist employees in return to work. Quarterly workers' comp liaison meetings have been ongoing as well, uh, having been conducted via Zoom since the pandemic. The purpose of these meetings are to provide guidance on workers' comp best practices to our workers' comp liaisons to ensure a positive employee experience and ensure employees receive timely medical care and benefits. Workers' Comp 101 supervi tra supervisor training has also been ongoing since the pandemic. The purpose of this training is to help supervisors and managers understand their role and responsibilities in reporting claims timely to Intercare and helping to facilitate benefits and return to work for our injured workers. This past fiscal year, Intercare completed a virtual Workers' Comp 101 supervisor training for all of our Workers' Comp liaisons. The Firefighter Fast Lane Program continues to be an effective program which pre-approves doctors at Kaiser to conduct all relevant diagnostic testing, prescribe physical therapy, acupuncture, uh, and perform surgeries which help to expedite treatment, recovery, and return to work for firefighters, bypassing the utilization review approval process at Intercare. This past fiscal year, 119 firefighters utilized the Fastlane program. 
the police fast lane one year pilot program, which was implemented in August of 2020 due to the success of the firefighter fast lane program ended on August 31st, 2021 and was adopted by the department, HR, Kaiser and the San Jose Police Officers Association as a formal ongoing program. Similar to the firefighter fast lane program, police officers receive expedited diagnostic testing, physical therapy, acupuncture, and surgeries bypassing the UR approval process at InterCare, which aids in treatment, recovery, and return to work. A total of 141 police officers utilized the program this last fiscal year. In these closing slides, I'll provide an update on our safety management system and health and safety program. This slide highlights several of our health and safety program initiatives. Regarding the first bullet point, program manager, staff worked with city managers, with the city manager's budget office to permanently delete a vacant senior analyst position and add a program manager uh, position to support our health and safety division. This position will work with departments to develop and implement a safety management system by developing and adopting safety policies, trainings, and best practices to ensure regulatory compliance. The safety scoreboard, the quarterly citywide safety committee meetings, the OSHA 10 hour certification training and the stop for supervision training have all been temporarily suspended since the pandemic due to staff's primary focus on the COVID-19 pandemic. But the programs are anticipated to be implemented or resumed before the end of the current fiscal year, provided COVID-19 cases drop significantly in frequency. The city's ergonomic program continues to evolve with the goal of improving employee education and training, thereby reducing repetitive motion injuries. Ergonomic assessments of employees' workstations continue to be completed citywide by department evaluators and or by an ergonomist when requested by a doctor. Refresher training was completed for 11 department evaluators this past January. This training refreshed the evaluator's knowledge of ergonomic concepts this training also focused on home ergonomics so that evaluators can better assist those employees working a hybrid schedule. Regarding wellness, a virtual health fair was conducted last year in October and an in-person health fair is scheduled for October 19th of this year in the rotunda. Kaiser will provide the following services, fitness assessment, blood pressure checks, BMI calculations, and derma scan screenings. Booths will also be set up for vendors providing information on a variety of health related topics. The Human Resources Benefit Division also hired an analyst who starts this Monday to focus on developing and implementing a wellness strategy. In addition, the contract with our current EAP employee assistance program provider MHN is expiring at the end of December. An RFP has recently been completed and the new vendor concern was awarded a four-year contract beginning January 1st, 2023. Concerns offering includes a robust first responder program, including a network of specialized providers, life coaching, in addition to mental health counseling in person, via online and or by phone. In conclusion, staff will continue to focus on safety and injury prevention, as well as effectively manage the third party administrator inner care to reduce injuries and contain workers comp compensation costs. The suspended workers comp and safety initiatives will be reestablished when COVID-19 cases decrease so that the division can refocus on implementing and resuming the initiatives. Workers compensation expenditures for 21-22 exceeded the adopted budget by approximately 4 million, primarily due to workers comp settlements, which amounted to 3 million 236,360. However, the impact of CNR and STIP settlements over the past four years on projected ultimate losses reflected a 6.6 .6 million or a 2.5% reduction over the past nine fiscal years. The division will continue this strategy of CNR and STIP settlements to further reduce projected ultimate losses as well as reduce our open claims inventory. And that concludes our presentation. Any questions? Thank you very much.
We'll go to members of the public first. As a reminder, this is on item D4, workers' compensation program annual report. Um, and sorry, anybody in the audience, not seeing anybody, so we'll go to Zoom. Um, Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Sotos on the horseshoe. The, I've been to these meetings where workman's comp is assessed. I've been to the meetings where retirement, early retirement due to injury is assessed. And I think that the role that I play in these meetings is that I challenge my government. That's healthy. That is democracy. That's what democracy looks like. Democracy doesn't just sit back and cheerlead and, oh, well, yeah, that's what you guys said. Okay, well, shoot, sounds good to me. And uh, let's move on. No, I actually participate in the meetings and I read the memos and then I listen. And what I hear is the last time that I was at a meeting with the, with the workman's comp and the person was asking for an early retirement, there was absolutely not one shred of evidence that, was, that stated on the record that there was anything work-related about the person's injury. Oh, the person had the injuries. Oh, they're there. But there was absolutely no shred of evidence that linked her injury to the job. But hey, look, sounds good to me. Boom, give it to her. Give her an early retirement. And there was no link between the injury that she had and whether or not she acquired it during the course of her duty. This, this is, I mean, I don't know, man. I just, I just, I come from a place when that kind of stuff is happening, you kind of smell smoke in the air. Why? Because the public's getting burned. That's why, because there's smoke. And so, I mean, you know, I'm perceived as like, like the enemy in the room. Why? Because I come to these meetings and without fear, challenge my government. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the words of Paul on the previous item and this item. Uh, yeah, I this stuff is kind of new to me and hearing the last words of, of this item, it looks like you're in a bit of a deficit situation that uh, good luck how to talk about uh, this issue. Um, how worker comp can relate to the conversations of the past few days about uh, policing, more police staffing. Um, you offered some interesting ideas in the past few days, how to uh, help the future of uh, policing and grow its numbers a bit. Is it possible to want to think of more creative ways to, to consider policing that consider involving the everyday community more? I just thought I would put that out there as, uh, you know, I think we saw some really imaginative, interesting ideas in the past few years that uh, can possibly address these worker comp issues and address uh, the future of uh, different ways community can be involved in the future of, of, of more police. Uh, that's about all for myself. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. And not seeing any hands up from my committee members. Um, so I just have one question. Thank you for the, the report here. Um, and actually, uh, maybe along the lines of where uh, our public commenter, Mr. Soto, was, was, was going, in this report, um, this annual report, we actually don't talk about maybe some of the after-the-fact follow-up on, on some claims that may have actually been fraudulent. And I do know that we actually have, have uh, followed up and, and, and actually gone after uh, employees that, that may have potentially had fraudulent claims on disability or, or at least what their level of ability or maybe you know they 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 weren't but they're they're out and able to do what they had stated they weren't able to do um and i personally have have brought forward some of those concerns and i know that they've been followed up on where does that come is that is that a closed session discussion only um because it involves um you know our, our city attorney's office but i'm just kind of curious because i i know that's a it, it doesn't happen often this is a pretty thorough process that we go through but there are times where that happens, right? And, and, and I know that it gets brought to our attention and your attention from a lot of times other employees. Um, and so where, when does that get um, heard by the, by the council? 
That's a um, very good question, Councilmember Hollis. I we don't typically report on those things as they're confidential personnel matters, um, and we don't actually typically report on them in closed session either. Whether or not there's an avenue to do so, I would have to talk to the city attorney's office about. We can follow up with you. I had asked once before, and um, I believe it was yourself and maybe the city attorney that did give a brief overview on some of the the the, the statistics, right? So that because obviously it's very confidential. I do think it would be worthwhile, even if it was only once a year, maybe to coincide with this annual report, that then the council in a closed session discussion was also provided a bit of an update on that, just to kind of show um, what the data might look like there. Again, I know it, it at least from what I'm aware of, it's, it's, it's um, few and far between, but I think that would be helpful. Uh, and I, I, I recall it only happening once and it was because I had requested it. And so um, if that's something that you think is you know possible, I think it would be worthwhile for the council to have that annually to coincide with this report. Sure, absolutely. And, I, and if it's just statistics, that's probably not an issue um, reporting it in, in, we can add it to the memo, but we'll definitely talk to the city attorney's office about which, which avenue is best. Okay, so that would be my only ask as an addition to um, accepting this annual report. So if the maker of the motion can include that, I would appreciate it. We don't have a motion yet. So. I'll move to approve with what, Councilmember Hollis? Second. All right, thank you. And no other hands. So can we get a roll call vote, please? Adenas? Jones? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Morales? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that takes us to open forum. Blair? Just as a reminder, this is uh, on any items not uh, that were not heard on today's agenda. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, thanks a lot for the meeting today. Um, I am, I guess, once again to offer, uh, I really hope there can be solutions to the future of the Ukraine area. I think we have to be accepting of initial two-state solution that was started before Russia invaded Ukraine. And it was kind of the basic tenant of how to be working for the future of that area. And it's with that, that the ideas of racial equity and health and human services could be very much applied to a future of negotiating peace instead of continual war. Good luck in those efforts. And, um, I just have to also uh, admit, I'm pretty disappointed with how you're offering statistics about uh, you know, different uh, surveillance technology in these meetings. I think we have to really review how to be more honest with the public about this thing. Uh, oversight, uh, open public policies, and, and honesty about statistics is kind of an important three-legged stool of how we talk about the future of technology in the city. Uh, I'm pretty disappointed with what how it was talked about today. We can talk about uh, the future of uh, billboards, you know, the, the electronic billboards with its data collection issues. That was a big fearful item six months ago. If we have a more honest dialogue that's available now in this era of, of abortion data collection, uh, let's hope we can have that conversation. What exactly is the bundling of data? Uh, thanks for your time and uh, Thanks for the meeting today. I hope we can talk about this this fall. These exact things I want to talk about this fall. Thank you. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, I'm going to give my city a little glimpse, a little taste of what I'm working on. The San Jose City Hall that's downtown over there at the Civic Center is uh, people want to demolish it. So I want the most egotistical, ambitious politician that I can find to get his support or her support because that building is a civil rights museum. Why? Number one, Janet Gray Hayes, first female mayor of any city in the United States. Janet Gray Hayes, Al Garza, first Chicano to ever represent on the city council in 1971. Norman Mineta, the first Asian mayor in the country. Ron Gonzalez, first mayor of San Jose to be Mexican since 1846. That is a civil rights museum in the making. And that's what I'm gonna be pushing. I'm gonna be pushing hard. Now, if I can move a 12,000 pound statue with research, the truth, tenacity, and courage, what do you think I'm gonna be able to do 
with the Norman Mineta Foundation and legacy, because that legacy there, Norman Mineta's, is going to back it 100%, 100%, because that building, they want to, it costs $8 million to demolish, $8 million. However, it only costs $100,000 right now to maintain it per year, per year. Why would you? I got pictures right now of Richard Nixon in 1968 when he was uh, vying for the presidency of the United States right there in front of it. Right there. It's at San Jose City Hall. Richard Nixon's right there. Robert F. Kennedy's been here. John F. Kennedy's been here. Oh, no, no. There's a legacy here. So like I said, I'm all points bulletin out for the most ambitious, most egotistical politician. Because I'll take you there. Back to the committee. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.